I'd like to call to order the community forum. Uh, January 18th, 6.30. Um, do we need to take a roll or anything like that? We can just go right into it. No. Yeah. <laughs> Introduce ourselves. Okay. Um, sure. I, I'm, my name is Megan Arquin. I'm the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. I appreciate all you guys showing up here to join us in, in talking about um, projects of the past and projects that we look forward to, to fund in the future. Um, but just to, it'd be nice for everybody to get to know the rest of us on the committee, so feel free to introduce yourselves. Jennifer Uncles, I'm here representing the Conservation Commission, also the treasurer. I also represent the, the recreation uh, focus on this. Um, <coughs> Margaret Orler, representing the Historical Commission. Mike Wisman, I represent everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellie Kurth, uh, representative of the Planning Board and Clerk. And could our audience members or our other participants also? I mean, I know Ben Barsowski, but and sure. I know Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence Dorsch, I'm um, here yeah. on behalf of the uh, library trustees, but here for the Graves Library building. Mm -hmm. And I'm Liz Sillen. I'm on the Historical Society. I'm a member of the Historical Society and here just to talk about the Graves Memorial Library building as well. Great. Great. Um, Is it S-I-L-L-I-N? I have a, a little spiel about the, the Community Preservation Act and how it affects Sunderland. This might be redundant for you guys, but for the folks that maybe watch this video later on, um, this could be some helpful information. So I'm gonna read it, because it'll probably come out better. <laughs> the Community Preservation Act is a growth tool that helps committees, pr uh, communities preserve open space and historic sites, create affordable housing, and develop outdoor recreational facilities. CPA also helps strengthen the state and local economies by expanding housing opportunities and construction jobs for the Commonwealth's workforce, and by supporting the tourism industry through preservation of the Commonwealth's historic and natural resources. These funds allow our community to create a local community preservation fund for open space protection, historic preservation, affordable housing, and outdoor recreation. Community preservation monies are raised locally through a surcharge of not more than 3% of the tax levy against real property, and municipalities must adopt CPA by ballot referendum. The CPA requires that communities spend or set aside for future spending a minimum of 10% of their annual CPA revenues for each of the three following categories, open space recreation, historic preservation, and community housing. The remaining 70% of the funds are undesignated and can be used for any allowable project in any of the CPA categories. This gives Sunderland flexibility to determine our own priorities. Some of the um, guidelines that we have adopted for Sunderland specifically, people applying for um, funds here, uh, we encourage that all the projects have a broad resident benefit and participation contain forms of cost sharing, have positive impact on town operating budgets, have town revenue potential. Um, and finally, the CPC seeks to maximize the impact of Sunderland's limited CPA funds. Therefore, we encourage projects that creatively leverage and supplement town CPA funding with other income from public and private sources. In the pursuit of implementation of CPA projects, the CPC pro promotes wide town involvement and an enhanced sense of community spirit. That's just a little snapshot of how. Uh, priorities. Priorities, yeah. Uh, Jennifer was gonna talk through the money. Dollars. Um, so I made a copy for anyone else who is coming from the audience wants it, and I think you all have it. It's the Sunderland CPA Fund Status and Project History. It's also available on our website, uh, for the CPC part of the website on the town website, along with a bunch of other resources that are there on the website too. And this shows all the projects that we've funded in the past and what what the town has collected from the surcharge and what the state match has been. And we have 
still gotten a 100% match um, for the CPA money that the town raises. So every project we have in town has used half from the town's money and half from the state money. Um, so it's been a great, great part of that. Um, and that's because we have the 3% surcharge and there's a couple round, two or three rounds that the, the state distributes from and only the 3% towns get that maximum amount. And because of the whatever formula they use that takes into population and property values of the town, we're in the best rating as, along with the other four towns in the Frontier District. We're all in the same, same boat of best potential for getting 100%. And there were only eight towns last year, this past match, and we were one of them that got 100% in the whole state. So we do have, um, I don't think it, does it show in here? Yeah, over 890,000. It's an estimated amount that we'll have available for future projects. And that's an estimated uh, revenue of what we have expected to come from the town raising. And then if we get an, another 100% match, um, that would be bonus to what's in this total. Right now it's just just the town match in that total. The town part is in that total, the 890,000. So that's a healthy amount for good projects and years to come. Any questions about the dollars of the CPA fund? Also on the bottom of that, it just shows how, how the projects have been parsed out in those required categories. Open space is currently 20%, historic preservation 15%, community housing, community housing 21%, and recreation is 42%, and then the administration has been 2% over all these years. So we're meeting the requirements of that 10% for each category too. Where does the administration costs go exactly? Like, is that a fee that we pay to the town to help administrate it, or is that the state, or just cumulative from all the projects? In the beginning years, we, we hired someone to help with the, the project management and filing and getting on board. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, it's mainly to pay our dues with the Community Preservation Coalition. Oh, wow. Okay. Yearly dues, and then anything that's not used from that budgeted administration amount goes back to the pot. So I forget what the total is like. I might get it mixed up with conservation dues. It's okay. I don't want to say. It's a minimum amount we have like, to vote every year, right? Yeah, it's like $890 or something. Something, yeah. Something like that. And they're our main resource for any questions we have. They maintain the database and all the resources that every town relies on for community preservation questions. Any questions, Bob? <clears throat> well, um, we wanted to offer any sort of updates from, uh, or, or just information in general from any projects from the past. Um, and Dan Borshevsky showed up here to give us an update around the, the Sunderland uh, Early Childhood Playground. So please feel free to share with us anything Great. Good evening, everyone. Ben Barshevsky, the principal at Sunderland Elementary School. Uh, the early childhood playground at Sunderland was last renovated in the early 2000s, and by the mid-teens, it had definitely started to show its age. And so in the fall of, uh, late fall, early winter of 2017, we approached the CPC um, to request, start the process to request seed funding um, to go towards the site analysis, analysis and conceptual design of the new playground. That following April, um, it was approved by uh, the townspeople of Sunderland and that really started to get the ball rolling. That initial cost estimate arrived in October 2018 and came in at a whopping $437,000 um, as, as the first run through for that space. And we knew that was too much. Um, and so from there, we started working hard at um, looking ways to cut down that overall cost. 
And we did, we did do that in a few different ways. We sought community donations. Um, we lined up uh, uh, labor and in-kind donations as well. We also looked at the overall conceptual design and identified areas where we could potentially save some money as well, right? And so um, we chose a few new play structures that may not have had all of the bells and whistles as one that was originally proposed and that um, ultimately helped to re reduce the cost. A um, few years later, we did come back to the CPC and requested some more funds. We were granted $200,000 um, for FY22. In addition to that, we received $75,000 from a state parks and rec grant. Um, that same grant also helped out the um, Riverside Walkway um, here in the center of town. We used 13 additional funding sources um, to go towards the cost of the total project as well, ranging from school choice money to school grants to reaching out to local businesses, community member donations, um, and that, that brought us to $65,000 that we were able to raise through that. The final cost of the project um, when all was said and done was $352,000 and um, you know a good $100,000 less than the initial cost estimate um, if you include that plus the, the seed funding. So uh, we found that it was really successful in, in the ways we were able to cut down on the total cost. Um, I do want to recognize publicly the different organizations and businesses that helped with the project. The Sunderland Elementary School PTO, uh, as I mentioned, we had community member volunteer work and monetary donations. The Sunderland Elementary School graduating sixth grade, sixth grade classes of 2019, 2020, 2021. The Daniela Zinn Memorial Fund. Daniela Zinn was a Sunderland parent who had passed away a few years ago due to cancer. And that funny, uh, that family has made a, an annual monetary donation each year. Um, and so we use money from that, that fund to go towards the playground. Delta Sand and Gravel, Allstate Materials Group, Charitable Fund, Kearsarge Energy, USA Waste and Recycling, the Home Depot Foundation, Northampton Pediatric Dentist, Dentistry, and the B. Gorey Fabrication Company. The finished product of the playground follows um, a farm and field theme, paying homage to the farming community here in Sunderland. Uh, the color scheme matches uh, the, the beautiful farms here as well. The playground features raised bed stock tank planters for fresh vegetables and flowers. Um, there's boulders, there's logs, there's climbing structures. <clears throat> it also includes a biking path. And some of the money we spent on, on this project included balance bikes, right? So when we all learned how to ride bikes, we had training wheels. Well, the, the new way to go about it is <laughs> giving the little kids bikes with no pedals. And so by the end of each school year, our kindergarten students are zipping around the playground following on the path. It's, it's really cute. And it also has an updated uh, safety surface. And I do want to, um, you know, really thank the Community Preservation Committee, our school committee, uh, the select board, and the highway department of, of Sunderland. You know, one of the ways that we did uh, cut cost was the site prep. And so our high, highway department helped to remove a big portion of the P-Stone safety surface. And, um, and actually, Delta Sand and Gravel took a lot of the material off our hands. And so they're always, always quick to support us. Um, any questions about the project? That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It really is great. Thank you for leading that project. Yeah. Like, I appreciate it every day sure. when I walk past it. And I mean, it took somebody to, we all saw the need, but it's great that you took that on and worked on it. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's pretty amazing to see all the people that, you know, in time showed up too for, mm -hmm. for you in the school there. Well, 
really yeah. sweet. Excellent. Any questions? Any thoughts? Ben, thank you for sharing. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Another couple of projects that we wanted to also um, uh, update was the um, the coalition um, has a, an amazing website that featured a story about the Sanderson Place uh, project and how well that was executed and um, you know they really wanted to sh feature what it takes to submit the application and get it from the beginning you know the thought all the way to the end and so. Um, you can go to the website and see that story featured there, um, communitypreservation.org is the website there. Um, so that felt really exciting and nice to be recognized for that. Um, another, uh, another update that I wanted to offer for <laughs> you guys, maybe the grapes, the, the repointing of that. Would you guys like to share uh, yeah. that project? It's a bigger story than that. The There's a couple other things that I'll just say that Jeff wanted me to um, also put in there was just that the Riverside restroom is also complete and the pickleball courts um, are, the design is complete and the next would be uh, the bidding, construction bidding and trying to, so I think that, um, and actually one other thing that I don't have on here is that the church electrical is com completed uh, but a lot of the rest of that project will be starting in the spring. Yeah, so. the roof and external will be when it's better weather for that. Mm -hmm. um, but please share. Yeah, we're here for the Graves Building, which um, <coughs> is still under the purview of the library trustees, and we have an MOU with the Historic Commission, and the uh, building is being used by the Historical Society. So I don't know how many of you have been in there in recent years or remember being in there before, but I'd say. In my opinion, it's probably our most significant town-owned historic asset, and so that's why we're here. Um, so I think in 2021, there was a request for $69,000, which was for exterior masonry pointing and masonry sealing. Um, that, if you go back a little further, the town had actually commissioned a, a report called, that we informally called the Brown Report, that was an assessment of all town buildings. And this list of needs of the graves is what came out of that report. Um, and so that money funded two things on the list. Um, not, to be totally honest, I'm not sure if one was actually the top priority, but it was, you know, we appreciated the money. And we actually, um, there was a little bit of a delay with COVID and uh, other things forming a committee. And we actually got an RFP out this year to try to pursue the um, project to start. And to start, we really wanted to hire an architect to run the project. Um, previous project, when we replaced the uh, roof on that library with the uh, clay tiles, uh, we entered into a preservation restriction with Mass Historic. So any exterior work on that building has to meet uh, Mass Historic standards. So we really can't embark upon, we really don't, it's not really a job where you just call a contractor and hope it goes well. Like we really need specifications, we need someone who's watching the job and managing it, so it really needs to be an architect-led project. And to be frank, it's hard to get an architect to lead a $69,000 project. It's just sort of not big enough um, and has a lot of fussiness. Um, so we put the RFP out for architectural services and didn't get any responses. Um, and I think we need to sort of look at this in a different, slightly different way. So um, I really, I think we really came here to have a conversation with you. I think Jeff maybe um, let you know that maybe we need to rethink where that money's going or how we're going to use it. I think one option might be to look at this entire list and see like maybe it's worth adding to that $69,000 and really just dealing with, you know, none of these are flashy things. It's all foundation work, painting the fire escape, looking at joints, and maybe rebuilding the steps. I think together it might be one large enough project that we would be able to get someone interested enough in running it, and we could get all the work done properly. Um, so I guess 
one thing we'd like to know is, is that something that you think you guys would be open for? I think it would be pretty much in the realm of doubling uh, what we what had been asked for previously, but I think we would get a lot more accomplished and probably more effectively. Caveat is that these all these estimated numbers were done, I think, pre-pandemic, so we probably really need to look at what the legitimate costs are, right? You know, in today's economy. Um, so that's sort of one thing. Um, the building is being used. Uh, if you want to talk about how it's being used, yeah, I mean, you may be aware that the historical commission and the historical society share use of the building, and we have a lot of historical artifacts in there. But our historical society has been sort of moribund, I guess would be. <laughs> and we, have, uh, we are working toward revival. We've been open every week now for several months. Uh, we are working to, you know, we've put a lot of stuff online. I don't know if you've ever gone to swampfieldhistorical.org, but we have multiple hundreds of our items online. We have people approaching us every week now with interest in genealogical interest in history and I mean we've really sort of we're, we're, we're coming to life and people want to come to the building every time I put the sign up somebody shows up it's really fun um, but uh, you know what is evident is that it is not handicapped accessible and so at some point we are going to have to embark on a study to see whether that's going to be feasible without destroying the historic character of the building. Yeah, so that's sort of part two of maybe something coming down the road. I don't know that we'd get it together this year. We actually did have an architect come out pro bono to look at the building with us. And um, I think the steps there would be, uh, you know, not to just assume that you're going to sort of be exempt and provide um, uh, duplicate services for someone somewhere else, but to really make an attempt to see if, if we could make the building accessible. And if you look at um, the work that's been done on the North Amherst Library, you can mm -hmm. see, um, I don't know, does everyone drive by there? And it's, it's like, it's that's really so a lovely good. project. Yeah. Um, I think our building's more complicated and our site is more constrained, but it's not impossible um, to do a nice job getting accessibility to a historic building. So I think that would really be a study, um, and then see if we could come up with um, something that was feasible, and then that would be a pretty major project. I, we've mentioned it to um, you know, our state representatives and stuff. That's something that obviously we would need um, more funding for than I think you know, we would be probably coming to you guys, but also trying to get other funding for that. But I think you know, down the, ultimately, if we could create the accessibility of the building, it would be wonderful because there would be a lot more opportunities um, to use it. It's very, it's hard to justify having, for example, a public meeting there when you, when there are other spaces in town that are accessible. So, um, so right now it's kind of a repository. Um, it is used occasionally for meetings, you know, and accommodations would be made, but it's really not, it's not ideal. So. That's just something to consider down the road. But I think if the town, you know, is going to retain the asset, we should be thinking about how we're going to steward it properly. So I know a request have come in um, from Jeff about the money that was previously awarded and hasn't been spent yet that it might be spent on something else. And we, we haven't gotten any say from the Community Preservation Coalition on how to do that. But it, uh, my gut is that it's, there's enough work to be done that you want to keep that project open and use it for what it was intended for and then come with another application for some of the other things. I think that's another way to look at it. If, if I haven't really given it. I mean, I think, I think that would be another way to look at it and a way to make it a more a, a project that we could really get done. And then we would basically be able to say we've done every, we've addressed all the current needs. I mean, there's still going to be, um, there's, there's, there's still maybe other things with the heating system and things like that, but I think. It's beautifully right now. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that that, that might be the better way because then we don't have to sort of reallocate that money. But um, 
the biggest chunk of that was for the exterior masonry pointing, which is probably the most uh, probably needs the, the most uh, attend. You know, it, it's not the top priority in terms of the number uh, how quickly it needed to be attended to, but it was the biggest pro It was the biggest part of it. So I would like to. I think when what is the deadline to get next Friday? Is oh, next Friday. <laughs> the deadline, but that's just the beginning. So yeah. if you if you had we could put in a placeholder the numbers you have for yeah. an estimate, and then as the, have another meeting in February, maybe yeah, more fine. I I think if you guys are open to that, that that would be the smarter thing to do, and. Um, I don't think we have a lot of opportunity to look for matching funds. The only thing I would say is that the town is holding on. When we did the roof project, part of the way that project worked is a chunk of money went into a, a, a restricted fund for the building. So if you really felt like matching funds were needed, we could take some money from there to match it. But on the other hand, if you have money that's available, that's you know it may be wiser for the town to hold on to that money for the building in case something else comes up, like the heating system or something that is not as so much historic preservation. And to fund this is really a historic preservation project. It's not like we would be getting money from a from a third party that you know great this you know this is a grant we'd be taking money. From our own coffers, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's much of a match. Much of a match, and you know, maybe shorting the building in the long run. Right. It would be good to have some kind of other support if there's any private donations or if there is any other grant that can supplement, because we do like to have some kind of evidence of other support for for the projects. Um, beyond the CPA money, but it's not a killer to the project either. Um, this is not sexy stuff. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, <I don't. laughs> and then just looking at the list and making sure it's historical preservation and stuff that would be not maintenance, not um, aesthetic, not um, some more of the internal things might be less qualified? I don't know. It depends on what I haven't seen the list. But just having whatever estimate you come with to be the mm -hmm. what's really instrumental for the historical preservation of the building and, say, and use of it. The difference between maintenance and historic preservation is a, is a pretty fine line. I mean, you know, if you're doing masonry repair, that's historic preservation right. and repair <laughs> maintenance. But um, I think all of it falls in line with what it is that the State Historic Preservation Office expects us to do in order to properly maintain the building consistent with our easement with the state. So. Are we talking about historical in terms of the guidelines of CPC grants? Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> isn't the use of the building by the Historical Society and the Commission, wouldn't that make any work done there? Not any, like the heating system probably wouldn't qualify or putting in light, different lighting, I don't know. Even though it's the repository of historical artifacts from the town? I mean, it seems like, like creating a correct environment for historical artifacts from the town would qualify under the guidelines, no? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the Conservation Commission person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd have to, I'd have to dive into the exterior work, and I don't really know where you would draw the line between maintenance mm -hmm. and historic preservation because the fact is we have to meet preservation standards to do anything on the exterior. Yeah, I mean, I think if you submit the application, then I think our job is to kind of refer to the coalition and, and the guidelines that they set on the website and try to work within that as, as they define it and, and how you're defining it also and try to make the best decision there. But there, there is a lot of information for each category on the, on the coalition site that, that may help steer that thought process a little bit also for you guys. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Under the historical preservation category, it is a little broader than it would be for like 
fixing up the Riverside restrooms that just went in right. and right. what's going to be capital improvement and what's going to be maintenance. Right. It's pretty clear. Right. But it's a, a broader area, I think, right. for historical preservation of buildings and resources. So. But there is I mean, something. We got money from Mass Historic to do the roof. Is that maintenance or is that preservation? I think it's preservation. Preservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, repointing is maintenance, but we funded it. It so preserves the building. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, I think whenever you, whenever you, your language is slanted towards historical preservation and not maintenance, <laughs> as, you write, as you write it up. So. The only language I'm seeing from the website is very broad. Mm -hmm. Well, come visit us. It's really great. Beautiful building. Wednesday, are you open? Wednesdays in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. What time? One to three minimum. Maybe that's what's going on. How many people do you have manning? How many people do you have manning the building? Womaning. One. And Laura Williams. Alternator, we do it together, and then Mike Michael Lewis comes too. Um, but it's been, you know, this it's just been great to have people coming and being so fascinated to see the building and excited to have it open. And it's uh, so we hope to have it open more because it's it's really been fun to see the community response. It's just immediate. It's great. So. Would you host a class or two? You betcha. In elementary school? Absolutely. We've had kids, uh, moms come after school and bring the kids in. We've actually ended up staying open later because the kids come in and they just, they love it. So it's healthy. Can we have a special time for the kids? Sure, there? absolutely. Yeah, we're great. We are here for the community. So we're leaving this that you're going to put in, submit a. We're submitting something by next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we didn't want to get into having uh, the previous one then become an open-ended thing. So we wouldn't do that, but then to rehash it seems unnecessary. It's already there. So you want to add this? So we're going to keep that in place and let's see what we can add to it. Right. I think it's, I think, what the heck. Unless you look at the list of things and it's like, a little hard sell, but... Um, we have, by the way, the whole, I mean, this whole list, which is prioritized, that was done by Carl Fiacci, who was on Historic Commission, and he went over it with a sort of fine-tooth comb and put everything in the order in which it ought to be done. And so that, that's kind of why we started rethinking what should come first. think and talk about the future obviously we've got some information there from you guys and um, you know what does the town need what does the town want and has, any, has anyone heard of any projects right. brewing in Thank conservation you, historical preservation housing we do have Stuart Beckley representing the housing committee was not able to come tonight and shared some ideas for the uh, housing side. Again, big accolades for the Sanderson Place and Lauren Starr, who's here, who's the champion of keeping that project going through for many years. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And what the other teammates and people that you had helping along the way. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really, um, it's just super nice. I mean, I've gone over there to a couple of events and people who just, you know, they're, it was life changing for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's had a great impact on the center of town. I think anything, any reservations people had have been uh, put aside. And I think it's um, really a great a good addition. I don't know. I'm very proud of that project. It should be. That's great. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. 
So when we're looking at other opportunities in town, um, Stewart's doesn't know about the cozy corners and what's what could happen there but the previous survey of the town didn't have any other town properties available for a similar similar project um, and then using CPA funds for uh, an administrator is appreciated but wondering if if we needed housing guidance if we could use CPA funds for that um, to pay for expertise of developers that were part of the North Main Street project to help plan a similar project if we had something moving on. So just other ideas for housing money to be used. Um, but the Cozy Corners is not a town-owned property, so it's not under our purview. So. And I don't know if you have So that would be step one is the town buying the property? No, I think it could be still run by a private person that would go toward that affordable housing route and then there could be CPA money that is part of that somehow. Mm -hmm. You would have to have that restriction added to the property so it stays affordable in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. I know nothing. Is there a way to incentivize that for the cozy corner property to the current owner? To, uh, is there a way to say that funds would be available for affordable housing should there be uh, that use contemplated or something? I mean, I, I do feel like it's a, it's a fabulous location for housing. I think so, I'm not sure, <coughs> but it seems like there could be even though it's going to be privately owned, if there's a town benefit and town receipt, and that would come in that preservation restriction for the affordability. Um, but I think they're dealing with zoning requirements right now to see what can happen on the property and make it feasible for development. We're going to have a public hearing at the next planning board meeting for a zoning change because if in order to bring any zoning change to town meeting we have to have a public hearing ahead of time and so our next meeting which will be the second tuesday in february will be a public hearing to talk about a possible change to the zoning bylaw that would allow them to um, keep the building structure like the exterior maybe not the same, but kind of like the same footprint building itself and convert it into eight units. Affordable or just eight units? The bylaw would just be eight units, but you know, members of the community could certainly come to the um, public hearing and express interest in that too. Um, and the way we did, you know, the way we did San Francisco Place was sort of clean because we bought the property outright and then the town had control over it. And then we did all the studies and then we gave the property away. With, right. You know, so it was, so I guess what you're saying is maybe we can, is there a way to take the money and incentivize yeah. the, uh, by contributing to the project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys allowed to be proactive, I guess, is part of what I'm asking. Because mm -hmm. you did so add money to Sanderson. Well, it still somewhere. has to go through the process. Yeah. So it has, and it, I think it becomes a harder sell at town meeting to give money to a private entity. Surely. Um, but but if we did give money to Sanderson Place after we bought the property. We got the first chunk of money, right? Bought the property. Then we went to town meeting. They asked us for another $100,000. Which, which you gave them. But they were a nonprofit. But they were a nonprofit yeah. and it was mm -hmm. right. already underway. Right. So it is possible. I do know that um, another member of the planning board toured it, the building some like uh, several years ago and she's a contractor who focuses mm -hmm. on affordable housing and she felt like she couldn't make it like there wasn't enough there enough value in the building to make it work for her
prepared purposes. There's, isn't there 10 acres there? There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of land. I mean, you have to really be, I don't know what the role is, because I mean, I think what we learned from Santos and Place is, you know, when you're in that business of like, like Valley CDC and the Franklin, um, uh, the, you know, the Housing Authority, you're basically looking for all kinds of funding. I mean, it's not inexpensive, yeah. and it's not, you know, it, it's only affordable because it's so heavily subsidized. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be in that. And that, you know, when people went and looked at that property, they were the only group that could come up with a proposal because they understood that system. If you just, you know, the de kind of developers that went in there didn't work for them economically. And if these guys are thinking of a zoning change, then they must not be contemplating a 40B, right? No, we're over the 10% threshold, so um, that's off the table. Don't even need it. No, no. You, can't, you can't do a 40B if you're over yeah. the 10%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. I'm sorry, I have to go to the next thing. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I think. I appreciate it. We'll get something into at least at least a placeholder. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other whispers of projects? Mm -hmm. Yes. The lights will go on as you go down the street. I'll come find you. I'll come. Find you. Okay. It'll be okay. dark, but the lights do come on. I can say on the conservation side, there are um, there's always interest for the conservation commission of pres preservation of priority wildlife habitat or other natural resources in town, and there's some things in the works, and so not this town meeting, but maybe by next town meeting we might have something to um, come to a, a request for CPA money to supplement some other grant and, and the Conservation Trust together to preserve some land. That's not farmland. Well, it is currently farmland. <laughs> <laughs> but not prime soil farmland. <laughs> um. Do I know what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but nothing for this year. But if anyone's out there that has property that they're interested in preserving, give us a call. <laughs> Good plug. Okay. So, is that everything? Um, well, as far as uh, housekeeping, there is to approve the minutes from the last meeting. And then uh, we have a Jennifer put together the annual report that is to be submitted so we can do uh, a look at that and make any suggestions or get it correct. We had, they changed the date when we're, for which this is supposed to be submitted. That's what I don't think it's due till March 4th. Okay. So it's, we have this to look at. Do we want to? So we, we can look at it and, and have a final to look at at our next meeting and then okay. approve that. Yeah. Right, because we have a February meeting. Right. Yeah, sometimes. February 1st. February 1st. Is it February 1st? Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes. I Thank you. So I have a grouse on the minutes is that I'm not listed. And I do miss meetings, but I was at this meeting. So. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know when I was typing I your name I made no in, impression whatsoever. I was using that as a template, and I'm like, was Mike at the last one? <laughs> sorry. Okay. So you can amend the list. I apologize. Yeah, you made the list. Not that it matters, but I want to be recognized when they show up. So. Oh, yeah, and we had the whole conversation about the cemetery. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Which we, I'm actively working on getting, so this is money that will be spent this okay. summer. I apologize. Yeah. Just defending <laughs> our tardiness. Um, any other concerns? The dates are all there. That's spelled right, right? So. 
uh, to us as two minutes. I move to approve the minutes as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Great. Um, okay. The. Did, um, if anyone got a chance to read the annual report, just sent it recently, so probably not. Um, but it's basically the same as last year, where it lists the projects that were approved for the year, and then an update on the how many towns were getting 100%, and what the town generated from the surcharge for that year of 2023, and then. With special thanks in the wording here, I would love if anyone has any input on special thanks to Helen Clark and Tom Feidenkevitz for serving on the CPC since its inception in 2011 and how they, their contributions were appreciated in the historic, not only having history of the town and, and their perspectives in that area, but understanding how valuable our resources are, both natural and financial and uh, human. Um, and then their true community spirit and, and being part of this committee and it's for so many years. And then welcoming our new people, Margaret and Crystal. Um, and then that last paragraph is the same as, basically the same as last year. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we got it. It looks like great start, but maybe we can, if anybody wants to look at it and bring edits for the next meeting. Yeah, feel free to email me edits and then I can add that to um, whatever comes to the next meeting. When does it need to be submitted back? I think it's March 4th. Oh. But we'd have to, Looks if we only have that February meeting, that's the last chance to okay. make it final. So March 4th, the next meeting? February 1st is the next meeting, but the annual report is due for March 4th. Okay, gotcha. Um, but we might have another February meeting if we're going to be working a process with the historical preservation of the building. Mm -hmm. And then March 7th is when we're probably voting on which projects to bring forward to town meeting. Okay. I think we've covered everything. Anything else we need to address? Forget anything? Seems pretty good. Seems good. Good job. Thank you for the minutes, <laughs> Ellie. Team. Thank you for keeping us organized. You're yeah. stepping right in now, Maggie. You're like <laughs> in the zone. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had all day today. Um, <laughs> then is there a motion to adjourn? So I moved. Second. <laughs> All right, all day. Bye. 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 Fantastic.